विराट हिंदुस्तान संघटन विश्व So I'm grateful to be here with all of you today, and I'm especially grateful to Dr. Sankhe for giving me this opportunity. So I had read about this India syndrome, and I wrote an article about it, and I shared with him, and then he suggested that I speak on this topic. So I'll be having a PowerPoint, and I'll be speaking three main points. If you would like to comment or question in between. after each point also i'll have a brief pause for questions and at the end of course we will have some time for questions so why is the west the so called india syndrome why is the west biased against india so i'll discuss three main points what is this so called india syndrome what bigger issue does it point to and what can we do, what what can we do about it so my main focus will be on the second and third part so what is this india syndrome this as far as i know it first appeared in the guardian and from their guardian it was faithfully replicated by several indian media outlets other media outlets other outlets also so this was based on a book by a french psychiatrist regi arolt the crazy now it could be it is a book is in french so it would translate crazy in india crazy about india crazy due to india there can be different translations of it so this book it showed a house at least it gives some accounts of how tourists who came to india ended up becoming severely psychologically disturbed so the article says that these people some of them were so disturbed that they needed they needed to be hospitalized some of them needed to be treated some of them had to be taken out of the country Sent back to their home country. Some of them were so lost that they were not even ready to go back to their country. So now this article raises several questions. So let's look at them one by one. First of all, what is the evidence? In general, there were no statistics given either in the article or if you look at the broader book also, it's calling it a India syndrome. but statistically how significant is this trend there is no clear analysis or justification of that there are no positive encounters in indian spiritually highlighted let's look at this one by one all that it gives is anecdotal accounts now anecdotal accounts have their value but their value primarily is in emotionally manipulating people and if we consider our broad indian culture even if one person is facing some trouble in india we are concerned about it our culture the atithi devo bhav so anybody who is coming to our land we don't want them to be disturbed or distressed at the same time what is the cause of the disturbance it could be that those people were disturbed before and 
they already had some psychological disturbances and those disturbances just erupted incidentally while they were in india so now the book addresses this possibility mentions this possibility but in the end it just dodges that and says oh this is the india syndrome so it's like nominally acknowledging the possibility but not considering that possibility very seriously one of the biggest uh, challenges whenever we are making reason we do any kind of reasoning or debate is that are we approaching the intelligence of people or are we manipulating the emotions of people so anecdotal accounts which are provided without any broader perspective they are generally meant to create fear or anger or negativity at the emotional level and that's why any serious sociological research anecdotal accounts can no are not taken very seriously it's not that they are neglected but how frequent are these in what context are these that has to be considered now one contextualization is through statistics we consider <clears throat> they say dozens of people have experienced it okay dozens seems to be a significant number but how significant is it considering that 17 million people come to india annually and this number has grown dramatically over the last 10 years since we have a government which is much more conducive to india's dharmic culture india's spirituality so it has provided many more support systems so the the, the tourists were about 5 million 10 years ago and now they are three times more than three times so has the number of cases include increased with a significant percentage there is not much statistical analysis of that so does dozens among 17 million does it merit so much significant coverage so this raises some serious questions about the intent so generally speaking we don't want to look at the intent of what somebody is doing let's look at the content of the argument and deal with that but when the content itself is given without a broader context then why are you focusing on this that question actually comes up another problem is that there are no positive accounts given if we consider there are millions of people who come to india and many people have been transformed positively many of the leaders of silicon valley they came to india I mentioned a few names over here and they had very positive experiences in india julia roberts is of the famous eat pray love book and movies also there on that so both males and females have come to india and they have had positive experiences enormously positively transformative experiences but those are not highlighted at all and these people came as spiritual they are on spiritual seeking if you consider at one person one from one perspective india is not especially if somebody is coming as a spiritual tourist it is not the most comfortable place to come to and yet people are coming nobody is forcing them to come they are coming because they are getting something positive over here so there is no only anecdotal incident without any positive accounts no positive possible explanations no broader explanations so what does it point to what what bigger issue does it point to like we may say that um, there is something called stockholm syndrome which okay it occurred because people some a case was found in stockholm of a person who was persecuted and that person became attached to the persecutor but that doesn't mean we consider all the people in stockholm are like that now so using a generic term like uh, india syndrome what does it signify so now uh, i had myself given the subtitle is why is the west biased against india so i would like to nuance that that there are difference between biases and stereotypes so what is the difference you could say at one level there are two fairly different things stereotypes are are more or less fixed and reductionistic conceptions oh you know these people like this or oh, these people are very miserly these people are uh, very manipulative these people are these people are very aggressive these people are fanatical so these are stereotypes these are reductionistic conceptions that means we reduce the entire demographic to a particular quality and how does that happen these people have few experiences with a small number of people but those 
experiences are heavily formative formative that shapes their opinions that shapes their perceptions that stereotype to some extent stereotypes are unavoidable because we humans can't interact with an infinite number of people so from finite samples we do make generalizations but stereotypes are bad at one level but biases are worse what are biases biases are you can say the negative emotion driven dispositions so biases are not just uh, because conceptions they are emotion driven and you know, these people are like this and that's how they are so even if somebody is presented some contrary evidence they'll just dismiss that no 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 those people are just making a show actually they are fanatical or actually they are, they are arrogant actually they are like this but some people make a show like that they reject contrary evidence and they only they highlight whatever evidence is supporting so stereotypes they can be changed not so not easy but they're not too difficult to change but biases are extremely difficult to change why because that person is emotionally fixated on a particular perception there's an american comedian who said that i have already made up my mind now don't confuse me with the facts don't confuse me with the facts well <laughs> then how have you made up your mind so that is indicative of bias now in general whenever we see people speaking negatively about us it is best to start with giving them the benefit of the doubt maybe are these people biased or are they operating on some stereotypes so to understand this the west itself is a very very big big you could say geographical spread by the west what do we mean are we meaning uk are we moving up meaning america are we meaning australia are we meaning new zealand so west itself is very broad now it does share some common attributes but still it's very broad so i will focus primarily on uk and america over here when i talk about the west so now if you consider the average westerner they have more stereotypes than biases stereotypes and biases maybe 10 15 20 years ago people had the stereotypes that india is the land of snake charmers now now very few people now as indians have settled in the america and people have indirect interacted with the indians they don't have that stereotype right now but there are other stereotypes that have come up in their places but now what happens with stereotypes average you could say the average westerners are in general aware, aware that stereotypes can be wrong and we should avoid avoid stereotypes so for example i was once giving a talk and uh, at that time i just mentioned how gossip spreads and how misconceptions spread and i was talking many of you may have heard of the game of chinese whispers the chinese whispers is what that i was giving this talk in washington so chinese whisper is what one person speaks something to the second person then second person speaks to third person and by the time it comes to 10th person it has become completely different distorted exaggerated that chinese whisper so then after that the organizer of the program told me you know don't use the word chinese whisper this is because it is derogatory to chinese people it is not that only chinese people do like this anybody can do like that so i appreciate that that uh, that caution and i avoid, avoid that henceforth and it was not that this person was particularly favorable to chinese people this person a proper american he was it organized a program for me an indian monk so but the point is it's not that the average westerner is biased against india they have stereotypes and they are also aware of stereotypes in general uh, where ignorance can be a satisfactory explanation there is no need to presume malevolence ignorance means those people don't know malevolence means they want to destroy us so if ignorance can be a reasonable explanation malevolence doesn't have to be considered an explanation so now with this understanding i'm not saying that there are people who are not biased there are people who are biased also but it is not that average westerner is necessarily operating under biases now beyond that in the west the left and the right are very prominent uh, 
political political groups so i'll try to know in the west are there biases among the influential groups we could say in the west there is the left and then there is the right the left are largely socialists and the right are largely christian conservatives so for example in the in america there are two political parties the republican and the democrat so democrats are largely uh, left oriented and the republicans are largely right oriented so now both of them have some strong perceptions about india so what we are trying to do is that when we encounter negative perceptions from the west about india now where are they coming from and in the last section we'll discuss what we can do about it now among the left what what is what is the left and the right over here basically the left are people who are always against any kind of hierarchies they are people who are concerned about those who are left behind by the existing hierarchies so they feel that oh you know this power structure this person left aside this person is exploited how can we help them so that is the positive side of the left and the right are those who are concerned about what is right with the current system don't just change it a lot of things are working properly don't just indiscriminately change it that's a broad understanding of left and right now so how does the american left perceive india so i'll talk about two things perception of indians and perception of india now why am i differentiating two things because when i'm talking about indians quite often in the west their perception primarily happens by interacting with indians in the west no the average westerner may not meet indians in india so their perception of indians is shaped by their interaction with indians their attitude towards india is shaped by what they read in the news what movies they watch and stuff like that so when i <clears throat> so their at what are the attitude towards indians indians in the west are hugely successful indian the chinese are probably among the most influential and wealthy at least among the most materially wealthy and successful minorities in america they are very successful now because of this what has happened is indians are often seen as a part of the privileged elite and the attitude sometimes becomes negative towards them so they are in general the left are supportive of the minorities but what happens is indians although indians are in minority but indians are successful so they say okay you are not an underprivileged minority you are not a discriminated minority and that's why they are much more favorable to muslims any criticism of islam is immediately labeled as islamophobia and they are sympathetic to latinos and especially towards blacks so now of course how much they are they want to help the minorities or they want to use the minorities to further their own political interests that's a different issue but broadly speaking their attitude is they not very sympathetic towards indians because they see indians as a part of the successful elite so just a few uh, last 2 or 3 years there was a elaborate court case going on with respect to indians and chinese especially indians parents suing the ivy league universities because what happened was even if the indian student has a 5 out of 5 5 out of 5 cgpa still that student will not get in in admission in the university whereas somebody with even a 4.3 or 4.4 cgpa if that person is from the the black or latino demographic that person will get admission so indians are perceived somewhat negatively because they are successful now as far as their attitude toward india is concerned they will think that oh india is the place where there is this discriminatory caste system and this is perpetuated by the brahmins orthodoxy so this is a place of discrimination now if you consider the lived reality of india in most urban places the caste system is hard the caste is hardly a very important factor yes in the villages it is prominent and especially it is because of politicking that caste becomes very important but otherwise in today's india caste is not that important a factor but that is their perception now what is the attitude of the right that is how the american left perceives india now how does the american right perceive india the right right especially means these are conservative christians so the lefts are prominently 
in america they say there's a division between the coastal and the central so mostly the left is new york <clears throat> new york washington la san francisco <clears throat> these cities are very much dominated by the left and the central parts of america it could be arizona then texas then florida these are all quite dominated by the right so how do they perceive it indians as far as indians are concerned oh you are successful that is good but if they are successful what happens is they are seen as threats to or at least non candidates for christian evangelism because in one sense uh, christians have been evangelizing among the minorities quite a lot there are i was invited for interfaith conference in dc and they told me that they have churches for special denominations that means there are separate churches for people who are from mexico there are separate churches for people who are from brazil in their language with their food so somehow they have not been able to make any churches specifically for indians indians who go to the west they what happens is they are either so interested in material success and they are so happy with the material success that they are not interested in the religion much or if they become interested in religion they want to learn more about their own religion and that's where i'll come to the opportunity that we have a little later so they the american right also has some negative attitude towards indians because they are either non candidates for evangelism or they are threats and what is their attitude towards india it is india they see or at least they would like to propagate it that way is a place where christian rights are being oppressed the churches are being attacked the minorities are being troubled now again how much is it a reality well very little mm. the catholic pope also acknowledged that the india and Af india and africa are probably the uh, are the richest fields for the harvesting of souls harvesting of souls means that they want to convert people in india and they are converting it mass but still they they see it like that and they propagate it like that now of course there may be a few incidents that happen we don't deny that but quite often those incidents are not so much targeted against christians per se by right wing hindus they are just routine crimes that may happen against anyone and they are portrayed as attacks on the minorities christians so that's how the american right pursues india and through this overall so the two influential groups in the west whether it is left or right both of them operate with a significant level of preconceptions many of which are negative and of course within this there are a few people who are aggressively negative who are like on a, almost seem to be like a, on a anti india crusade but they don't represent the majority and they certainly don't represent the entirety of the western attitude towards india now of course everything is not negative there are positive perceptions and positive opportunities also if you look at the left there are many in the left who are fed up with capitalism driven uh driven initiatives so capital driven medicine agri agri business and commercialized religion the christians have mega churches so there are these people say eastern spirituality by east they include both china and india but eastern spirituality is much more much more open much more broad minded it is in general when spiritual seekers come to india most of the spiritual seekers who come to india are from the left very few people from the right come to india as spiritual seekers that's why i mentioned if all the four people i mentioned are the steve jobs julia roberts Larry Page, all of them. If you look at their political orientations, all four of them are quite leftist. So on one side, the left, in some ways, is against Indian hierarchies, but the left is what is most receptive to India as a source of alternative knowledge systems, alternative spirituality, alternative religious practices, alternative medicines. So yoga is also very popular among the left, not so much among the right. Although of course it is becoming so popular now that even Christians are recognizing. 
so there is a whole group they call it as christian yoga initially they said yoga is hindu and it is a hidden practice and christian should not do it but eventually they realized that uh, this is it has health benefits and christians are anyway going to do it so they tried to appropriate and say there's something called christian yoga but in general if indians are able to connect with westerners or westerners come to india most of the westerners who come to india as spiritual seekers or even have any kind of interest in india they are largely from the left at the same time the right with respect to the right also there are some common grounds we can work on there are we could, the right as i said they are mostly conservative christians so there is there can be atheism there can be nihilism nihilism is basically nothing has any meaning life is completely meaningless and in fact there was one atheist philosopher you can call him not a philosopher but he's a philosopher philosopher is one who gives sophistry of fools philosopher so he said life is meaningless and miserable the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow because life is meaningless and miserable so alberto camo he said that now he wrote many books and he said okay don't commit suicide today live on today he was one of proponents of what is called as existentialism but the point is nihilism is very damaging and it is often religion and spirituality that are sources of meaning so there are areas where we could also work together say for example there are fundamental religious rights of people which uh, which need to be protected everybody has the right to worship according to their own uh, faith that is something which uh, we can work together so at one level uh, i am a i am associated with iskon a monk in iskon so there are times when iskon was organ iskon as a organization was uh, was labeled by certain people as being a cultist organization for brainwashing people so at that time there were many christian groups who, who had studied iskon and they said this is not a cult this is a this is an ancient religion ancient tradition now they didn't they didn't really sympathize with iskon or with krishna bhakti or hinduism but they recognized that if today one religion can be labeled as a cult tomorrow we may also be labeled as a cult so in that sense there are common interests which we can have even with the right so having said this now what can we do about this so there is a lot of there are a lot of negative conceptions there are a few biases so how can we rectify this are there any comments or uh, questions at this point should i complete this and then we can open for questions or comments yeah i think you complete okay thank you so i'll talk about three things what we can do three c's consolidate cultivate and communicate so consolidate let's look at these three c's what i mean by this consolidate means actually we have a lot of resources available for us the cons- whatever resources we have we can unify and utilize those resources and one of the biggest resources we have are our nris non resident indians who are situated in various parts of the world and china is far far better in utilizing its people who are settled in the west than india is in india we often lament oh people who go to the west or they are just so example of brain drain or we think oh you people must be wealthy you give us some donations for our causes well okay yes if those people could have been in india and they could have developed, help india develop that's possible that's wonderful but they can help india develop and give give india an influential voice even by being in the west so if they can become potential spokespersons for the positives of india then we can consolidate those resources a few I, i have traveled at least to 25 30 countries across the world and spend a good amount of time in about 10 15 countries and whichever country i have gone to i have seen indians are highly respected indians are respected are hard working tax paying law abiding responsible 
one of my friends in america is a is a traffic cop and he told me that i hardly ever have to pull over any indian kids for speeding and even if i pull them over i they are very repent they are very regretful and in indians don't become homeless indians don't become criminals i'm not saying it's again general this is indians have a ethos so that point is indians are respected now of course respect can come with envy also oh you are so successful i want to be successful but india nri are actually a big resource if we want to change the perception of india in the west and what china has done with respect to this is remarkable what china does is that they actually have a systematic track record a database of who are the top students from china who go to american universities and the chinese government has departments dedicated to interacting with these students and engaging them in some kind of china activism not overtly but at least covertly so and this is not just something which we can do but this is also what nris want many times when indians go to the west initially they enjoy the freedom over there oh there are no parents no elders no inhibitive culture i just want to enjoy life but that phase doesn't last for very long maybe 5 years 10 years once they get married and settle down they start realizing that actually this is not the kind of culture i want my children to grow up in and that's when they start trying to to transmit indian culture and indian values to their children and that's when they start looking for what is indian culture and what is indian values because they themselves don't know it very well so if we could align if we can connect with them and then that can be a significant influencer so it, um, so when in the west this is called as advocacy and advocacy groups are there so major religions jews for example have very influential advocacy groups islam also has created a lot of advocacy groups advocacy groups means what that these are in muslims in influential positions and they advocate they seek support and they exert pressure for furthering important causes for muslims so we we actually indians already india already has a rich resource base in terms of indians in very influential positions in the west now we may say oh they don't have any patriotism well not necessarily some of them may be may be but not many many of them are quite open that's consolidation then second is cultivate what do you mean by cultivate there are influencers who already appreciate india and there are young people who are quite interested in indian spirituality and they may want to enter the field of social influence so these need to be cultivated these need to be cultivated so that you positive perceptions of india so for example i was talking with uh, i was talking with an editor of times of india recently and he said that you know i see that you know you gives although the so the catholic church is a minority church in uh, number of christians are so few but there are so many news about the church which come in the mainstream media but there are so few news about hindu organizations or hindu festivals or hindu causes so they told me that, you know if i want to report about some event in the church i know their spokesperson they have come and met me they have spent time with me i know whom to contact and they are eager to contact me with most hindu organizations i don't even know whom to contact so now it is not true for all hindu organizations but the point is there are influencers and not everybody is biased so if we can cultivate them that's very helpful and another thing is there's a big difference another demographic that we could consider as jews the jews are probably among the most persecuted minorities in world history but still they have become very influential and one reason they have become influential is that they have entered into fields of social influence so law journalism media hmm? what has happened is indians on the other hand have excelled in many fields but those fields don't necessarily don't necessarily have have 
they don't change public perception on important issues so indians often go in the software and actually this is stem we go into stem fields science technology engineering math so in these fields we don't influence public opinion much public opinion social issues so we need to cultivate people who can influence if somebody wants to choose a career in any of these field like journalism and media in the west the parents also need to encourage them and not just in the west even in india success in this these kind of careers are encouraged then eventually we will have voices over there and last is communicate i communicate what i mean is that there are people who have positive experiences of india and indian spirituality that may be indians here in india that may be indians who visit from the west and come to india and go back indians who have settled in america or in the west and they have had good experience in the childhood much of indian discourse centers often on how the west is so biased how the west treats india so unfairly it focus often on complaints and condemnations and after some time that just becomes tiresome people feel this is is just a victim narrative is a tired narrative yes is india victimized yes but everybody claims to be victimized so after some time people just get bored by this people just turn off because of this so among the among christians there is a minority group called mormons and these mormons they their founder practice polygamy and because of that and because of those and some other practices they they, was, they were pursued very negatively in the west in america itself but there was one christian girl mormon girl specifically she in her she was in her late teens and she was a good author so when she was on 21 22 she wrote her autobiography of growing in a mormon family and it was not like simply completely whitewashed but it's a first person account and that book became a new york times best seller and what happened by that is it significantly changed the american mainstream perception of mormonism is this a narrow minded bigoted religion no it's not necessarily like that there may be some people like that but if you consider are there any books like that say hindus who have gone to the west no, i'm not talking about hindu saints and the autobiography of a yogi or books like that written by spiritual leaders i'm talking about lay hindus who who are successful in their businesses who are successful in their careers they write something about spirituality i'm not saying it's not there but it's relatively less so if we can become more forthcoming in sharing our experiences just complaining that the narrative is unfair is biased is negative that will not in the long run change the narrative so much we need to provide a positive narrative as we provide a positive narrative more and more then gradually what will happen is the negative narrative will change and one big advantage of the social media as it has erupted as it expanded is that social media in many ways is much more democratic than what is called as a legacy media legacy media means today if i even if i write a well articulated letter protesting against the guardian's coverage not only will guardian not publish the article if i write one guardian may not even publish my letter it's completely depends on them now we can try to create our own newspapers and our own media but through social media it's possible to reach a large number of people so if we can just culti- encourage the ethos of communication let's share not that we have to be rose tinted and share only the positives but there are a lot of positives when you share them that can lead to a significant difference so the buddha krishna concludes by saying arjuna to arise arjuna is rejected he has put aside his bow but at the end of the gita arjuna picks up his bow and is ready to fight so that call to arise is for every one of us there is a, ultimately is a confrontation between ideas we need to rationally articulate the good that our ideas bring to the table not emotionally militate against others negative ideas about us what happens is often the responses in their emotionally driven and their negative there are protests and criticisms and condemnations they only further the narrative that hindus are reactionary uh, reactionary and right wing extremists who can't tolerate criticism and we play into their hands instead 
as we start rationally articulating then this can make a significant difference and there is a lot of potential for this to happen as our younger generation is be two three things i would say younger generation is more much more savvy about social media younger generation is also although we may say they are distracted by social media but they are active on social media and they are also in one sense receptive to a wide variety of influences so if their influences from our tradition our culture come through they can they can not only receive them but they can transmit them and the opportunity is huge through youtube through facebook through social media through quora if we start sharing the positive narrative who knows no one part it takes just one video to become viral and then so many people can watch it and then it just it becomes like a snowballing effect in a positive direction so there's no need to to just become angry or dejected or frustrated there is a lot of hope for positivity that india is rising and not just in the political or the economic domain but even in the domain of ideas we can rise and that is where our our spiritual legacy can play a very distinctive role and this is not just to defend india but actually that india can contribute something valuable to the world and we want to help in the world scenario if the negative perception of india decreases then it's not just that it's our national pride that is maintained but india can india has much to offer to the world which can help make the world a better place and just as hearing the bhagavad gita help arjuna to rise similarly we all can rise by looking at the current world and seeing what we can do in in our own small way to bring about a positive change so i'll summarize i spoke broadly three things today first thing was we discussed what is the india syndrome it is based it is a report of a few people uh, suffering emotional disorders or psychological disturbances after visiting india so the it is statistically insignificant it is mostly anecdotal and uh, there's no consideration much consideration of previous circumstances that might have caused it and there is no description of positive experiences of people positive transfer experiences people have had now what does this point to is that the west is biased against india well more than biases there are stereotypes biases are very strong emotionally driven negative conception negative dispositions whereas stereotypes are small experiences generalized too much and we discussed about how the right in the west the right and the left both have certain stereotypes the left see indians as a part of the elite because of being successful and india as part of the discriminatory caste system the right sees india as oh, we are not candidates for conversion and we oppress christians in india but there are avenues for reaching out to both of them that alternative spirituality alternative medicine alternative wisdom traditions the left is interested in that and the right there are shared causes such as fighting atheism nihilism other such things can work together and to be able to work together how can we counter the biases or stereotypes that are there three things we consolidate that is we already have a lot of resources which need to be brought together one of them is our nris and second is cultivate that those who can influence society we need to cultivate them carefully give them time and those among our youth also who have that ability cultivate them help them understand in this ritual so they can share it. and last is we communicate the first person just as the anecdotes in this book have had and have they influence people negatively so we also share anecdotes share our personal experiences and that's a very powerful testimony and we all can just as arjuna rose on studying the bhagavad understanding the bhagavad gita we all can arise and do our part in shifting the narrative about india thank you very much are there any reflections questions comments ऑडियंस में से किसी को क्वेश्चन है हरे कृष्णा 
Yes. Uh, Danut, Prabhu, this is Nikhil here. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes. 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 So, uh, like touching on the point on the last slide where you talk about Arise Arjuna. So, I think that you hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, what is to be done. But again, then there's the problem of mindset. Uh, you were talking about how Jews got into avenues where they're able to influence. So you could also probably add finance in, as one of those categories yeah. through which they influence. And also, so just being in those positions uh, may not necessarily help, but then also having a mindset along with it that we need to collectively come together and promote our common interests. So what I see in the di Indian diaspora abroad is mainly they are uh, behind material, uh, you can say, sustenance or growing materially. But when it comes to coming together on such uh, issues, we may be a bit lacking. So before I, this is more a comment than a question. So I knew somebody who was the general secretary of Hindu Forum of Britain. So he was sharing something with me. So he said, uh, if he wanted to meet the home secretary of UK, he would uh, call up the home secretary's office, book an appointment and go and meet the home secretary. Similarly, there was a Jewish body like the Hindu Forum of Britain. If the sec secretary of the Jewish body wanted to meet the home secretary, he would call the office and the home secretary would come and meet the <laughs> secretary of the Jewish body. So numbers matter, but it's more that mindset and how you are able to organize yourself better matters more. That, that is my comment. Thank, thank you, Prabhu, for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, it's true. Uh, in one sense, uh, if you see in broadly Indians, we have had to survive through centuries of uh, foreign rule. And because of that, what has happened is we have learned to focus on individual success and individual excellence. Whatever be the system, there's a lot of resilience. Whatever the system is bad, somehow we will find our way and we will move ahead. But the idea of changing the system itself, that maybe in the British rule and before that in the Islamic rule, the possibility itself was not there so much. So that is not generally the focus. So Indians, that in general, what happens is, now again, I don't want to generalize because India is a large country and Indian, there is so many people with different mentalities. But in general, the idea is that we focus on our individual success, our maybe our family, our extended family success, protection, but not as a broader way of influencing society. But that will change. It will change gradually as we recognize it more and more. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but right, right now, India is not, in the Indian voice is not that much respected. It's not that much considered a very serious voice. So it is It is a sad reality. But I think as we consolidate more and more, it will happen. Uh, Kamlesh Sankhili has made the point that an RI source must be used, but we need to do a lot of not in India itself. I agree fully. Because this is, a, this is an article which had come in The Guardian, and from there, it spread to the Indian media. So that's why we are focused more on why is the West biased against India. And that's why we talk about NRI. But yes, in India itself, a lot of awareness needs to be spread. And there's a lot of opportunity also for that. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Sankhi. Yeah, so uh, from the discussion, I'm just taking the thread further that uh, the uh, phenomenon of Indians focusing on their individual growth family. Uh, Indians are typically jugadus, they call you know, they, <laughs> they will do something and you know, some, somehow they will survive and so they will go ahead and uh, naturally that's a very good quality. 
at the same time uh, our uh, one of our very close friends of vhs dr vaidyanathan you know he he talks about uh, something a concept of vaishyaization of every varna that means a brahmin is also focused on just earning money etcetera is also focused on earning money vaishya was already into it so it's like a vaishya mentality of just you know having your own thing full now what uh, see organizations like uh, iskon shri shri many organizations ramdev they are focusing on the uh, intellectual part the brahminical kind of uh, upliftment but the second part uh, which is like the kshatriyas the kshatriya intellect uh, in the modern scenario it's not that you know, take out a sword and all it's just the intellect of having the mindset that i can change the system see kshatriyas means they would create a system uh, they would sort of according to the uh, guidance provided to them by the sadhus and the scriptures and uh, change the system so that is something uh, how do you think that can be brought about that kshatriya mindset yeah it's it's difficult okay i write a lot on the bhagavad gita so one of the things which in the in the pandemic i have been doing a lot of research on is political philosophy and i i i did a search on the internet i found if you look at for bible and political philosophy quran and political philosophy if you look at even the art of war and political philosophy there are books if you look at bhagavad gita and political philosophy there are practically no books so i in my understanding there are two three things over here at one level if you see there was a the the spiritual resurgence in india that happened from the 14th 15th century onwards when there were many saints in maharashtra there were tukaram maharaj and namdev and sant namdev many others similar in the in bengal there were Ch- chaitanya mahaprabhu and others so that's where most of modern hinduism has been shaped in the foundation of the bhakti resurgence and that time the overall ethos was on individual spiritual development and that legacy has been carried on so india has a very rich philosophical and spiritual tradition how that philosophical tradition or spiritual philosophical tradition can be brought into a intellectual discourse with current current say socio political arrangements current social issues there is not much on that so this is an area where i would say that even as a organization like iskon other organizations we also need to work a lot more on this we can write we can talk on bhagavad gita and bhagavatam but consider i was recently when the pandemic happened i, I did a series of talks on grief and grieving how to deal with grief and i searched there's not a single hindu book on grieving i am working on something right now but christians have at least 25 best sellers on how to deal with grief from a biblical perspective so somehow what has happened is the philosophy as a matter of in, philosophy religion spirituality as a matter of individual practice has been talked about quite a bit hmm? but how do we engage this with a broader social issues that has not been discussed and there are many reasons for this one major reason is that india as a country decided not to have any religious studies department after it became independent every country has a religious studies department but india because we were born through the very painful experience of partition we said that let's put religion aside completely and somehow many of the traditional religious structures whether they are traditionally covered they support building temples but they don't really support religious education in terms of serious engagement with intellectual engagement with current issues so that's one aspect of it and uh, the other aspect is that so so what the abhyasika that you are having this is something which is very important initiative in that sense where we, we engage at an intellectual level with current issues but a lot more work is required in that direction and uh, there's something you could say like you can say hindu or vedic or indic think tanks which actually deal with contemporary issues 
in a substantial way we will need that quite a bit in future so that is one way that can happen another thing is that now of course chanakya many people refer to chanakya and chanakya is seen as a resource of political wisdom at the same time there is lot more available in the tradition and how chanakya teaching can be applied today that also needs a lot more a uh, lot more elaboration analysis contemplation so that's one reason you could say kshatriya the the how the spiritual philosophical wisdom can be applied for the kshatriyas that has not been discussed so much another aspect could be that i don't want to sound offensive over here that somehow we indians have have acquired a strongly negative stereotype about politicians that you know one of the fir- first quotes that many indians will know is politics is the last resort of scoundrels as among the west course people will know well okay but the fact is that power corrupts and the people who say that politicians are corrupt those people if they were given that level of power there is no guarantee that they will not become corrupt also so we may say that we are not interested in politics but politics is interested in us in the sense that politics is going to influence us so in that sense political engagement is important how we engage that may vary from person to person but a more active engagement in political situations not just just politicking as uh, manipulation and things like that but a more active political engagement see there is more of a there a lot of people are interested in political news and also in political views you can say but in terms of active political engagement to bring about a substantial change i think uh, my, more of our thought leaders more intellectuals more intellectually oriented oriented people need to enter into politics there was some survey which uh, i forget now now what is the average education education level of say the members of the members of the various assemblies legislative assemblies in america or uk and what is the education level of the people who are political representative political leaders in india so in india it was substantially lesser now, i'm not saying education is a solution that education itself will make somebody better but that indicates what kind of people are actually choosing to enter into politics so i think politics as a as a viable means for social change that also needs to be recognized adequately and chosen of course it's difficult and politics can be a difficult you could say even a dirty business at times but then in one sense bhagavad gita says that sarvarambha hi doshena every endeavor is covered by fault nothing is in this world pure that would be another point i'm sure you can add up quite a few more things these are just some of my thoughts beautiful very wonderful thank you yes. jagdish ji you have a question yes yes i have a question namaste ji my question is uh, it has been observed and already remarked and uh, especially with some of the scholars who are there and who go from here that various hindu groups there are numerous hindu groups they may be some telugu group kannada group marathi group or some temple groups or various other types of hindu or indian groups but when it comes to all these threats or onslaught or this phobia business none of our groups or our visiting uh, i would say religious leaders who have big influence in the us none of these religious leaders or the various groups think of uh, think of the issue together and especially recently when some of the universities were having this hindu phobia business mm. uh, none of them got united the way they should have got united so in spite of we having so many influence groups hindu organizations none of them are united and cohesive tackling these issues even visiting saints or acharyas or even shankar acharyas or whoever uh, i would not say shankar acharyas because none of them visit abroad perhaps but those who visit none of them are leading 
this battle in a very systematic way. So what is happening is piecemeal these things some people articulate, but we as a Hindu or an Indian group is not tackling this issue effectively. There may be some who may be doing it, but by and large, including Rajiv Malhotra was very unhappy. He says that I have been breaking my heads for decades and he is more worried about our groups, our uh, various uh, thought processes not being in proper place. So I, because you are traveling there very often and you must be visiting various groups, I wanted to know your views on this. Yes, that is a sad reality that <clears throat> many Indian spiritual teachers are not concerned too much with bigger social issues. Now, again, there are multiple reasons for this. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is that uh, maybe we as a group uh, have I'm talking about this from a what we can do as a solution perspective. Maybe we Hindus have outsourced too much of our expectations or too much responsibility to our spiritual teachers. What I mean by that is that if I, if I, I talked earlier about Christian think tanks, none of the uh, none of the Catholic or even the Protestant think tanks, hardly any of them have any the Pope or any bishops or pastors. These are lay Christians, but they have gained influence over time. So, of course, if the spiritual teachers speak something supportive, that itself is helpful. But eventually, what happens is, if a spiritual teacher or spiritual guru or a charismatic guru gets involved in a particular issue, sometimes they may not be that well informed about the issue. And then they make a certain statement and their statement can be used or misused to condemn the whole tradition. So, for example, you know, consider the RN invasion theory. Now, there are a lot of problems with that. But there are two, three Hindu gurus who wrote books criticizing the RN invasion theory. And their followers propagated their books quite extensively. But what happened was those Hindu gurus were not scholars. And their books had problems with them, logical problems, evidential problems. And what happened was their books became the primary representatives of what the Hindu right does. And then that became further targets for criticism. So my understanding would be that, yes, at one level, the, if the spiritual teachers could galvanize their followers to take up this, it would be not good. But beyond that, it is... Indian spirituality is not the responsibility of the spiritual leaders alone. It is more of the community, the congregation who has to take it up. Individuals have to take it up. And in my understanding, no spiritual leader who has some awareness will oppose it. They may not themselves take it as a priority, but in general, it doesn't happen in most, uh, uh, most traditions. That the, those who are spiritual teachers the whether they will take it up i don't really know if you look at uh, if you look at the indian tradition also we look at say uh, shivaji maharaj he was blessed by the saints but it was he who took up the responsibility of establishing the huk challenge against the uh, atrocities of aurangzeb so overall I think that it is upon the responsibility of the lay Hindus to take it up more and more. Because India has been a land of many different spiritual paths and to expect them to become united. What happens is, it is only when the, you could say that we use the word congregation or community, I mean, those are not directly spiritual teachers, but those are living in the world. But their concerns about the world are much more. So they are much more concerned about the world. So when they come together, so, for example, a Hindu leader from, a, say, Advaitic Sampradaya and Advaitic Sampradaya, for them to come together will be very difficult. But for a Hindu congregation member, you might become, somebody might belong to, be, to a organization that is Advaitic. Somebody might be belonging to a organization that is Advaitic. 
but for both of them they all they both have their careers they both have their families for them to come together will be relatively easier because their affiliation with the tradition is not so much controlled by the tradition's past so i would say that is a realistic way ahead and if we can focus on expecting less from the spiritual teachers and taking up more responsibility for unification and consolidation in in the hands of the congregation okay thank you Madhuri, you had some question. Prabhuji, I can ask yeah. one question. Do we have time? Yeah, yeah you can ask one last question. Okay. Prabhuji, uh... sir, you are talking about uh, you know politics and uh, you know the spiritual uh, involvement into politics. Do you think that uh, Sri Mad Dasbod, which was written by Sri Ramdas Swami for you know the general public and since he was also the guru of shivaji maharaj and if we see that you know uh, i think shivaji maharaj can be considered as the intellectual kshatriya of recent times so when we were talking about the kshatriyatva and the intellectualism political intellectualism do you think that shrimad dasbodh should be taken up as a ideal book well it's not so much a matter of uh what i think it is you know how we present that wisdom how we uh, whether a particular book can contain wisdom but it has to be presented in the contemporary language not just english but in the terms in the conceptual framework that requires hard work so i mean we'll have to discuss specifically about the merits of particular books to see whether how much they can be con- contributing i would say that it requires a serious study of the traditional text and a significantly serious study of the contemporary issues and then see how the two can be brought in terms of dialogue it is like there are some there's one famous one indian politician said that bhagavad gita contains the solution to all problems well you know in terms of getting some claps from people that kind of statement is nice but about from religious people okay how does bhagavad gita offer solutions to problems that has to be tangibly shown this is this is what the bhagavad gita is teaching and if this is how we apply the principles of the gita this is how this problem can be solved so there's a lot of i would say effort required to actually bring traditional texts in a to present tra- traditional texts in a way that they can offer tangible or uh, tangible pathways for dealing with contemporary issues Can i address your question yeah one last question from pravin uh, yes so prabhu ji from the from the western point of view the abrahamic uh, thought process is so deep rooted in their academics in their universities and in their political ambition also so it is not they do not recognize the eastern religion it is just a feel good factor which they want to digest actually and the so called indians they confine whatever knowledge they have for their own you know own tradition family culture whatever it is but not for uh, standing strong on those or expanding them into various geographies earlier it has been done we have seen basically how our culture has gone to thailand malaysia and little japan actually everywhere but recently we find that this is not happening and uh, one of the reason could be basically people are not able to differentiate what is sanatan dharma and they are not able to dis- you know differentiate how this abrahamic religion are planning directly their uh, deterioration and you know uprooting them from the root actually and this is happening uh, at all different levels in terms of regulations in terms of policies in terms of global uh, even universities basically when they profile the books they don't profile something books which they consider as right wings so i mean to say how do we make our generations aware like as as raji mahatra tells about you know being different so this uh, can you just answer this one yeah because they feel they read bhagavad gita but it's more of a feel good it's more of a psychological it's more of a getting over their problems but uh, yeah. when it comes to this question they are not able to tackle how is the difference between quran how 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 christians are thinking about them actually when somebody is thinking about you as a kafir and infidel it is very difficult uh, for a person who does not know anything 
about them and they can't plan any war strategy actually mm, that is true i would say that two different things first is that is the abrahamic faiths have a they have had a huge amount of historical influence in the west at the same time uh, presently their influence has waned substantially most of europe is functionally atheistic now there is a fear that with lot of islamic immigration happening the future is europe may go towards islam but right now europe is highly atheistic non theistic at least so america also some parts of america are called the bible belt but there are lot of christians who are concerned that america is just going towards materialism nihilism atheism and the does do the abrahamic faiths have a huge amount of influence in america in some parts of america a lot but in some parts they are also being persecuted so on issues like abortion or transgender and things like that uh, so it's not that the abrahamic religions have a huge amount of influence but what is happening is that as their influence in the west is waning they are finding that africa and india are huge fields for increasing the influence in fact uh, there are some churches in america now earlier there are churches in america which are actually importing pastors from india indians means people born in the hindu background who become christians they go and become pastors in america so it's like a reverse missionary effect you can say instead of western people coming as missionaries to india indians are going there also so so there is definitely the influence of abrahamic religions so but it is not huge are they shaping western policies towards india at least at present i would say the leftist narrate leftists are determining the narrative much more than christians in the abrahamic religions things were different maybe 10 15 20 years ago but now they are significantly changing having said that yes we sometimes focus more on yes all religions teach the same truth all religions are the paths to the same one god and yes you we could say that at one level but there are two different things over here one is acknowledging that different religions may have this, have the same purpose but despite having the same purpose even if you acknowledge they have the same purpose still there are irreducible differences and one of the key definers of a tradition's capacity of a tradition's capacity for living in a multicultural world is how does it treat outsiders see every religion has some name for its outsiders christians will call them as pagans the muslims will call them as kafirs in our tradition we may call them as mlechas and yavanas every tradition has a name for them but it's not just giving a name how do we treat them how do we deal with them so yes hardline islam hardline christianity they have a strongly negative attitude towards those whom they consider non believers and that's why a uh, sentimental all religions are the same thing that will not work we we that is a strength of our tradition so what i say is that there are three different kinds of tradition there is inclusivism there is exclusivism and then there is pluralism so we want to be open minded but we can't be so open minded that our brains fall out that our brains fall out that to say that all paths are the same that is not being open minded that is being empty minded so yes there are significant differences and we need to be aware of the threats and dangers from certain paths and certain conceptions in certain paths and we need to prepare for dealing with those i hope that addresses the question yeah yes yes thank you uh, i think we will we'll stop here i'll just make a few comments and then jagdish ji can wrap it no, up no dr sankhya ji you may wind up because i have raised my points uh, okay. to get some information so okay. not a problem we have gone into yeah, 20, 24 yeah. you may wind up and thanks chaitanya charan ji uh, charan ji for you. your excellent view point dr sankhya so, you may yeah. wind up so thank you uh, chaitanya charan ji so it was extremely stimulating scientific session and this is what uh, 
we try to do in abhyasika that our members they get educated on various issues like you know you really brought it out in an extremely scientific way not just you know being emotional and sentimental and you know just getting out burst so i'm very grateful to you for joining us and maybe in future again we'll invite you for some other yes. session and uh, yes sir i thank uh, rajiv ji and madhvi ji and ishwar and who are is helping to organize this madhvi ji you can uh, just take it ahead thank you chaitanya sir thank you dr sankhi for inviting me thank you